honor and privilege to share the hospitality of your home and also to play that role. The following is my personal ref reflections upon the process of the new park initiative, so it's very much my personal account and how um, I see it developing. 1968, sorry, 1986, was a dark year in the history of South Africa, uh, which was the seventh state of emergency, had been declared in the townships, the areas in the black population were forced to live, was occupied by the army. Many of the major organizations leading in resistance to apartheid and white supremacy, notably including the African National Congress, ANC, were banned. And the leading member of the ANC within South Africa, Nelson Mandela, was in prison. The previous year had seen the disastrous so-called Rubicon Address, when President P.W. Boerter had promised to bring change, but it stepped back from the brink. And this led to the collapse of the RAND and investor confidence in South Africa, uh, which combined with the international anti-apartheid movement pressure upon South Africa pushed the South African government seriously onto the back foot. But the negotiation process was paralysed. In Cambridge, I'd been finishing off my PhD in 17th century English history. But as someone who had been born and had grown up in South Africa, it was a deeply painful time. Amazingly, God threw me right back into the heart of the situation. Indeed, God used me more powerfully to contribute to peaceful change in South Africa um, than would have been possible had I remained in that country. I got to know Michael Schuter from the church, which we both belong to in Cambridge, and Michael drew me into working with him on a paper which eventually launched the Newark Park Initiative. It was entitled Alternative Constitutional Settlements in South Africa. Rather than prescribing this or that alternative, we suggested a way of looking at all the alternatives in the light of Christian principles and practical feasibility, as well as the concerns of the different communities. It was not intended to be the last word, only a preliminary document to stimulate constructive discussion and then to be refined accordingly. In the Cambridge paper, which I hope you'll read if you haven't done so already, I mention how on Christmas Day 1986 I found myself on a plane to South Africa with that paper in my briefcase and after careful consultation I invited six South Africans to a new park, the home of Jill and Crispin. The uh, Viscountess and Viscount Brentford. It was a small but diversely representative group who became the core of the process, which was eventually to draw in senior members of both the Africana and African establishments, building consensus about what a future South Africa might look like. Through this process, Mike and I developed the distinctive New York method bringing together people of influence in a safe environment and feeding in carefully crafted research, initially, in our case, largely prepared by ourselves, from Michael's economic expertise, my own training in political science, as we jointly oversaw the in-house team and later commissioned key experts, um, reflecting the diversity of views as well as drawing experts from the international community. We struck, I think, on a distinctive approach. These were not merely dialogues with the partisans bringing their grievances to the table, although there was something of that, but more importantly, they were future-focused, research-based consultations, which brought together and equipped a key group of peace builders, in touch with the protagonists, who could think through the long-term alternatives involved in building peace in an informed and open-ended way, guided by commonly held Christian principles. Unbeknownst to us, this confidential, what we call track two process, looking at the future structures for peace, took place with a secret, what is called track one process, involving, as it happens, some of the same people involved in our process, 
who were negotiating the direct release of Nelson Mandela and the unbanning of the African National Congress. Uh, there's a dramatic film which Christian was referring to called Endgame, which sets this out. This track through process, which we view involved in setting up, helped to provide the long term vision, while the secret track one process, uh, which had initially been initiated by uh, Oliver Tambo, the chairman of the ANC in England, um, and linked in eventually to, on the other side to uh, the successive South African presidents, uh, P.W. Boerta and F.W. de Klerk, um, that helped to unlock the way to uh, release Mandela and unban the political organizations. Now, coming back again to our Track 2 process, there were three phases. The first phase was the building up of a cohesive group of participants. And many of these, as I mentioned, were to play a crucial role in the Track 1 process as it happens. Um, but as well, some of these were later on to go and lead important initiatives of their own and had been involved in leading other initiatives previously. Others again of that group were, play, were to play a key role in facilitating the official process when that eventually came uh, on stream. So that is the first phase, this cohesive group building up process. The second phase involved the setting up of what we first was first called the Jubilee Initiative, and later on called the Christian Research, Education and Information for Democracy. Now this phase, preparing as it were the public consensus building, um, was owned by the South Africans. Uh, this was not easy for the international participants who had to let go, and the, the South African participants took it up and pursued it in the public arena. But the international phase, the New York Park Initiative phase, didn't end there. It actually continued, especially after the release of Mandela, and, it, and when the wider process moved into the negotiating phase. So this third phase went up a notch in terms of the seniority of the different participants because you could then be involving people more directly from the ANC and the government officialdom. This wouldn't have been possible in the first phase, one, because the ANC was still a bad organisation, but two, it was still then building up that cohesion which made the later process, the upgrading process, possible. So the three phases actually worked together in a way which together brought about a consensus which undergirded the official process. So that was the process which we in South Africa were undertaking. As an afternote to this, um, our director, uh, Professor Washington Dukumu, uh, provided in 1994 the decisive mediation which ensured the peaceful conduct of the first democratic elections in South Africa. He was a personal friend of uh, Dacia Butelezi, the Zulu leader, who brought him together with Nelson Mandela. But it is also through the important contacts and the a group which, which had, had been brought together by the NPI that this process was made possible. And I must also add that it was Michael and Jill's mother who provided the wherewithal for, for him to travel out to South Africa as well. So then, that was the South Africa process. Now after working on that, there was the Rwanda process, I was only involved in that in an advisory role, um, Michael will be able to say more about that. And then in 1999, I was drawn, up, drawn in uh, to oversee the setting up of the Sudan Peace Building Programme. At that point, the Sudan Civil War had resulted in the death of over two million people between North and South. But the Sudan situation was much more complicated than that, because each of the regions had their own problems, their own conflicts. We brought together a group from all the different regions, 
And this, I think, helped to build up, again, a cohesive group of people who could resource the official process. The official process had totally stalled at a region, it was the IGA, the process at, at a regional level. But by pursuing the track two process, we created the background trust, which eventually helped to ease the process when the official process got underway. And that was the Machapas Protocol in, 19, in 2002, which ended the war and was later on embodied in the Comprehensive Peace Agreements, which the, uh, what was then the Sudan Peace Building Program uh, was able to feed into and provide important undergirding understandings for. Subsequently, uh, the Sudan Peace Building Program, which had been under the auspices of the Relationships Foundation, or as it's called the Relationships Foundation International, was set up as an independent charity, Concordis International. Uh, Concordis operated more at a regional level in the south, in the east, and the west of Sudan. And the south, of course, eventually has become independent. And it's also pursued further issue specific work in the Côte d'Ivoire, in Kenya, and most recently Mauritania. Peter Marsden, who is here, uh, will be able to tell you more about this work. A recent development which arose, which emerged directly from my work in writing up the NPI in South Africa, has been the Ukrainian Peace Building Program. As I was immersed in the documents in my dining room, they all filling the whole dining room, I'm afraid, and I was sort of uh, totally snowed under trying to get back into what was going on. The Ukrainian situation was bubbling up and really impressing itself deeply upon me, and I was being increasingly distracted by what was going on there. And through a mutual friend, I resumed a prior contact with Valery Morozov, who I'm delighted to say is here this evening. Uh, there, Valerie, um, who has key contacts in the Kremlin and Mos Moscow Patriarchate, as well as with the Ukraine presidency and indeed the leadership of the pro Russian movement in the southeast of Ukraine. Valerie and I brought uh, the proposal of the Ukraine peace building program to Concordia International, and we're currently negotiating the basis for a partnership with Concordia to take this forward, and, and importantly, to get the funding for this through a series of comprehensive and research-based consultations using the approach developed in the, by the New Park Initiative in South Africa. The key idea here is that we draw on the strong religious allegiance of a large section of the Ukrainian population, 37% are very strong churchgoers, and there's a 77% who are believers in God, and just as we did in South Africa, we very much using that model, bringing together influential people, as well as church leaders and others, and members of the international community, to look at the options, the alternatives uh, for settlement in, in Ukraine, um, look in the light of commonly held Christian principles. So apart from Ukraine, uh, there are many other areas of the world which could be ripe for applying the NPI approach, uh, which may we developed first in South Africa in 1986 to 9, 91 rather, and then Sudan from 1999 to 2003. Um, that's bringing together a rigorously based research program with this cohesive group of people looking at the future vision for settlement in their country. Michael will, I'm sure, be able to say something more about that. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you very much, Jeremy.